Welcome, I'm Woody Labounty from San Francisco Heritage. Today we're going to look at residential buildings that are the epitome and essence of San Francisco. And they are not Victorians. As part of our Heritage in the Neighborhoods program, we're highlighting three San Francisco neighborhoods this year. The Excelsior, the Marina, and the Parkside District which is in the southern section of the Greater Sunset District. For the whole month of July 2020, we're focused on the Parkside. Take a look at our sfheritage.org slash Parkside page for more information, including other video presentations. Just a quick review, the Parkside neighborhood is in the southern part of the Sunset District. While it has its own identity, people tend to group all of this land south of Golden Gate Park together as a sleepy bedroom community, carpeted with cookie cutter stucco houses. Now, this isn't inaccurate per se, but the problem with neighborhood stereotypes is they can blind people to the rich character and diverse treasures that can be found in a neighborhood. As we saw in previous videos this month, the Parkside isn't all stucco houses, and stucco houses aren't all the same. When I say stucco houses, I'm referring to what is likely San Francisco's most dominant architectural form. Stucco isn't a style, it's just a facade treatment. When, you know, San Francisco might be known for Victorians, but the majority of the city's more than 208,000 parcels are occupied by single-family houses like these in Mediterranean Revival and minimal traditional and modern styles, all covered with stucco, or most of them. <laughs> you know these. One story over garage, five to six room floor plans, little parapets of red clay tile and precast decorative elements applied to stucco facades. And there's even simpler versions, inspired by more streamlined or modern aesthetics, or let's face it, to be built more economically. From the 1920s to World War II, merchant builders such as Henry Dolger, the Standard Building Company, run by the Gellert brothers, the Meyer brothers, Ray Galley and the Lang Company filled in almost all the sand dunes, all the empty buildable lots across the city with these types of homes in assembly line fashion. Here are what look like window sets piled up across the street in the sunset. Because of their ubiquity and the rapid style in which they were built, plus often a fairly casual approach to facade design, Henry Dolger called it, quote, putting on the architecture, end quote. These homes have generally been ignored or disparaged and until recently not considered worthy of landmarking or preservation. Note, by the way, that galley house priced in the 1940s at $4,585. But as I said, not all stucco is the same. Within that assembly line method, some builders and architects, such as Oliver Rousseau and Harold Stoner, took these popular period revival styles to higher levels, creating storybook cottages, chateaus, and castles. The Parkside has some fine homes and rows in Spanish colonial and Mediterranean revival styles. Some were created by the Parkside Realty Company, who used builder Ernest Swanson. Other lots were sold to outside contractors. Some of these highly elaborated buildings have a lot going on with tiled staircases, mini balconies, turrets, alcoves, all stuffed in 25 foot wide facades. Despite some fine interior workmanship and real thoughtfulness in exterior appearance, I mean, check out these shaped staircases on the right here along 26th Avenue. These were generally first homes for people, moderately priced. $6,950 in 1926 is a bit over $100,000 today. And in the Depression, houses were even lower than that. Part of why these types of houses have been traditionally looked down upon, I think, also stems from this affordability. 
These two houses are part of 10 lots the Stonison brothers bought in 1931 for $13,000. Each house built on those 10 lots was offered for about $6,500. And with the profits, the Stonisons or other contractor companies would go buy new lots and start all over again. The Stonison brothers, they would go on to build the Lakeside Development and the Stonestown Shopping Center and apartments. While any individual house may not feel important in itself, the continuity of the rows, the rhythm of facades playing off each other on a block face, it lends a significance to a group as a whole. Even in the minimally designed styles, who wants to break up this cute little trio with a new two or three story building? And if the design doesn't bring significance, if this just isn't your thing, a property may still deserve recognition or landmarking because of its affiliation, its connection. For example, this greenhouse on Terravel Street, bought by the first Chinese American family in the Parkside, desegregating in 1946 a neighborhood that had resisted minority ownership or occupancy. To learn more about these types of houses, I recommend reading the Planning Department's Historic Context Statement you can access it on our Heritage in the Neighborhoods Parkside page. There you can also read and watch more on the Parkside neighborhood. In August 2020, we'll be hosting a virtual town hall on possible preservation projects in the Parkside. Here's our contact information if you'd like to play a part. There are a lot of good ideas out there and maybe you have one we haven't thought of. I'm Woody Labounty from San Francisco Heritage. Thanks for watching and being interested in San Francisco's Parkside District.